from, from the user's perspective, just looking at, at the way that it functions, there's several differences between this and, and our application. So what we need to do now is look at the coding behind it that um, allows it to be uh, different. So here, I'll pass this around. You can take a look at it to get familiar with it. Uh, then we're going to look at the code. Android Manifest. Really nothing to see here, as they say. Really nothing drastically different than the simple one. Because, largely because, this doesn't require any additional permissions. All right? I don't have to run out to the internet to get this you know, to, to get this calculation. All the calculations internal. I, I'm not storing anything on my device, so I don't have to ask for permission for that. So, the manifest is really the same. All right. Okay. Values. I have a string file. And I essentially have the same thing in the string file that I had in the other one. I simply have an XML file um, that has a list of strings that are named and what their values are. Again, this is a great idea. This greatly increases the, the maintainability because I'm never going to have a hard-coded string in my code. I'm always going to have be pointing to this, which means that if I want to change something, you know, bill total for the meal in question, if I decide, gee, that's kind of awkwardly worded, all I have to do is change it into one place, and anywhere I use that string, it'll get changed. Better still, and we'll probably look at this um, probably next time, if I wanted to do a version of this for French people, all right, and I wanted to use the French language, all I'd have to do is create another one of these files and put in there the French translation for all those terms, all right? And then I wouldn't have to change any of my coding. And if the device was set to have a language of French as opposed to English, then automatically the French XML file would take effect and I would see those values as opposed to um, the values, um, you know, that are in there by default. All right. The drawables, sort of the same. There's just an icon. All right. Now here's where we're going to start having fun and seeing differences from the previous example in the main. The main, the layout is not a relative layout, but it is a, it is a table layout. It's a table layout. So, so when we think of a relative layout, like the previous example was, like the simple, tel the simple tip calculator, with relative you simply have, it's either going horizontally or vertically, and you simply have one thing after another. All right? If you remember, we declared these elements, and they appeared in a certain position, and we said that this one was after that one, and it just flowed right down the page. They're all stacked on top of each other. Only one, since ours is vertically, only one thing per line. All right? Here we have a table, and this is similar to like a table in HTML, because when we define this, a table, we're talking about having some rows and having some columns. All right? So we can have several rows, but we can put things side by side going across horizontally, simply by putting things in different columns. So... That's what this stuff means. And, and notice what attributes we have. We have a table. Um, the layout with match parent. So I'll make it as, as big as the parent is. In this case, the parent being the whole screen. So it will be the whole screen. Likewise with label height or uh, layout height. 
background color we defined, we give it an ID, we give it some padding of 5 dp, again dp meaning density independent pixels, which will take into account how tightly packed the pixels are on the screen. In other words, the denser it is, the more pixels it will use as padding because there's less space between the pixels. All right. Finally, the stretch columns one, two, three deal with what we're going to stretch out if um, we don't have um, columns to go enough. Actually, I'm not sure what stretch columns means. I probably misspoke. Stack Overflow is a great resource, by the way, if you haven't found it already. All right, by calling column shrinkable or stretchable, if marked as shrinkable, the column can be length, uh, column width can be shrunk to fit the table width. So in other words, those are going to be the columns if there's extra space that will be um, stretched out. Okay, just like in HTML, a table consists of a series of rows. All right, rows going across horizontally, one row stacked on top of the next row vertically. So we've defined our table row. All right, we've given it an ID, table row zero. We're matching the parent. The height is going to wrap the content. So in other words, wrap content means make it as big as it needs to based on the content. So whatever the tallest content is in this row, that's how tall the table row will be. And this consists of a text view and an edit text field. So what's the text view? The text view is a label that says enter the amount of the meal or whatever it says. What is the edit text? The edit text is the box that we actually put the numbers in. So in other words, if we look, the first row of this table first row of this table is this. The label is in the text uh, view, and the edit view is the value for that. Now, let's notice a couple things about this. The edit view, the edit text view, has a layout span of three columns. In other words, this table at most has four columns in it, right? If we look at any of these, the like this total row, there's a label label for total, there's a value for the amount, a value for the amount, a value for the amount. So, at most, there's four columns. That first row, though, only has two columns, right? It has the um, label, and it has the edit text view. Because two columns, you know, there's a total of four columns, and we only have two, we designate that this is going to stretch or span across three, um, three columns. So that's why we notice this goes across the first column and this spans the last three columns. 
We also, if you notice, have indicated that the input type is a number, decimal, which means that we can't, even on a keyboard, it's not enabled the other stuff. So I can't even type in uh, anything other than numbers, decimal points, and so on. So that's the first row. We continue on down the line, and we have a second row. That contains a total of three text views. Right. One that contains a label for 15% or 10%, 15% and 20%. Those labels again were found in the string file. I thought. Let's see, where are they? Oh, actually, they hard-coded these. Not a good idea to hard code those. All right. Simply because, again, if, if something were to change, then, then you would have to go in everywhere to see those. But again, we have this table row. Then have our third table row that has, again, a bunch of text views that are going to be set. contains this seek bar. All right. So that is the bar that we're going to slide back and forth. That will say the value. All right. So that's the name of the control that allows the sliding. Notice that what we um, what we have for the slider. We can identify a progress, which is the initial value. So when we open this up, it was set at 18%. By default, this custom slider, since it's a progress bar and is showing percents, the values will range from 0 to 100. But by setting the progress, we can set the initial value of it. So in a nutshell, how is this different than the previous one? It's a table layout as opposed to a simple um, relative layout where items are simply arranged one right after another. A table layout consists of table rows. All right. Each table row can contain multiple views. And by manipulating the, the number of the, the span of the column, we can have a, a given column take up on a row, several columns, like we've done with the text area. We then have some text views for the results, some edit text views for the results. In other words, there's an edit view in here for the calculation of 10%, 15%. So these are three edit views because they change. Now, how come I can't go in and type something in even though they're an edit view? It's through the attribute. It's, it's defined as not being focusable. So the user cannot put their cursor in that element. Then finally, we have a seek bar which a 
allows us again to slide back and forth and choose the percentages that way. Now, here's the thing. I don't expect you to have all this stuff memorized, but it should be clear to you the differences between a relative view and a table view. How the relative view simply strings things along one after another, whereas the table view allows you to create rows and put multiple things in. All right? How do you get the table to look the way that you want to? In this regard, it's very similar to HTML. You set the attributes of that table. All right? So, if we were to go in and change this, let's see what happens if we go and we were to get rid of the layout span of three on that edit text. What would happen? I unplugged it. In this case, really, nothing changed with it. Why? Well, it was sort of smart enough to figure out that if there's only two columns, it's going to stretch that last uh, edit text to match all three columns. Because there's only one column here and one column here. The table's four columns, so it stretched that. But you can't always count on that, so it is good to explicitly say through the attribute of which ones you want to, um, what you want to have it span, how many rows you want to have it span. All right, let's look at the code now behind this. So we'll, we're likely going to see some different code here because we're dealing with different controls. Here's our tip calculator class. And in it, we have instance variables for a lot of the things in our view. We have a private double for the bill total. We have a private integer for the custom percent. In other words, we're putting a double where we're, going to, where we're going to store this in. We're putting in an integer for this custom percent. We then have edit text for all the things that we are going to change. In other words, what are we going to change on this as we either slide this or enter something in here? We're going to change these six table entries, these two entries for custom, plus the percentage of the custom tip. So what all these are, these are pointers to the things that we are going to be changing. These things are declared in our layout file. So if we look in our layout file, oops, wrong file. If we look in our layout file, these are all the things that we've declared in our layout file, right? Because our layout file has that edit text. It has the different text areas to put the results in, all right? We're simply declaring those as instance variables here so we can write some code to access and change those. All right. We have that XML file. Soon, we're going to bring it to life and create all those different objects that are on that file. However, 
we need to point to those objects to program them, to do something with them. And that's what these instance variables do. All right. So, we're calling the onCreate for the superclass there, similar to constructor chaining. We're setting the content view to r.layout.main. What does that do? That takes our main XML file, this file that we were looking at a minute ago, and brings it to life. All right. We've described using XML the layout of our page. That is going to be a table. That is going to have a certain number of rows. That those rows are going to have a certain number of columns. That those columns are going to contain these things. We've described that all in here. This statement here, they use the word inflate, which is a good word. Another way to say it is that we're bringing it to life. We're taking an XML file and we're actually making that view that's going to appear on the screen of our device along with all the associated objects. So this, if you will, is what brings it to life. We have a chunk of code here that we're going to kind of overlook for now. Suffice it to say, this is looking to see if this application, um, if we're running it for the first time, or if we're bringing it back to life after going to something else. Let me show you what I mean. I can go and I can set, you know, I've set the percentage to 37% or whatever. All right. I can go in and put in an amount for the bill. So I have $444 for the bill, 37% for the tip. Now, if I go and navigate to some other application, right, I then went and I hit the home button and I'm looking at the weather. It's, this is an old weather. It's for September 19th. It has not been refreshed. All right. Try to refresh it. Oh, there we go. 50 degrees and cloudy. All right. So I can do some other stuff. I can go back to this application if I want. And notice that the values remain. All right. So the values will remain even though I went and did a whole bunch of other things. Why do the values remain? Well, because I've done this code. <coughs> All right. Now, these lines of code again are very important and all of them kind of look the same. up through here. All right. What each of these is doing is it is getting a pointer to the different objects that are on the view, the different objects that are on the screen. All right. We've inflated our GUI XML file. So we've taken that XML file, which is just sort of a layout that says this is what our view is going to look like, and we brought it to life. It's now up and running on some device's screen. And it has all these different views, all these different objects on it. And we're going to want to do something with those objects. We're going to want to do calculations, or we're going to want to put values in them, and all that. We need a 
reference to that object, though, all right? If you remember, we talked about object references, pointers. We need to be able to point to that item to say, let me get the amount that, uh, the, the, the dollar amount that was entered in there. Let me put the calculation for 10% in that cell on the table, and so on. In order for us to do that, we have to first point to that object on the screen. And that's what all these lines of code do. And all of them look the same, all right, with only a couple things different. Let's look at the first one. Tip 10, edit text. We're saying find view by ID. That means look on our, look on our view, look on that layout that we've brought to life, Look at the screen for this application, all right? And find the thing that has an ID of our ID, tip 10, edit text. What is that? If we look at our layout, that is this edit text right here in the layout. So now that variable, tip 10 edit text, points to this guy, which just got inflated, and in fact is this guy right here. So that variable is pointing to this edit text. However, we don't know, or how do I want to put it, we know, but the compiler doesn't know what view, what kind of view is pointed to by that ID. That ID could point to anything on our, on our, on our screen, right, on our page. That ID could point to a, a text uh, view, it could point to an, an edit text view, it could point to an image could point to our seek bar, our spinner control. It has no idea what that points to. So we have to tip it off, and we have to tell it. By the way, this thing that has an ID of tip 10 edit text is an edit text view. Therefore, treat it like an edit text view. So, that find view simply points to any kind of view. It could potentially point to any view on the page. All right? Whatever matches that ID, that's what, it's gonna, that's what it's gonna point to. Now we know that that isn't just any view. We know specifically that that's an edit text view. And we wanna treat it like that. Therefore, we need to cast it as an edit text view. And that's exactly what we do in this line here. So, this points to the view that has the ID of 10 tip, or tip 10 uh, edit text. That could be any kind of view. Could be an image, it could be anything. This tells that, hey, by the way, we know that that's an edit text view. So we're telling you, hey, that's not just any view, that's an edit text view, and therefore treat it that way. And if we notice then, this tip 10 edit text was declared as an edit text view. All right? And therefore, everything's okay. So now, that, ed that tip 10 edit text view is pointing to the text, uh, is pointing to the edit view on our screen. And the compiler and the Java virtual machine knows that it's a text or an edit text view, and therefore it can treat it like one. So we now have a pointer to that text view or edit view, and we can, we can treat it like an edit view. We can do whatever you can do to an edit view, which is what we want to be able to do. All right? We'll see.